Uh, to, to kick off uh, today's topic, well, we're going to be talking about uh, ureteral strictures. Um, it's, it's a condition that afflicts many of our patients. Um, I think generally uh, all urologists do something to some degree that may or may not involve ureteral strictures at some point in their career. Uh, so I think it's, it's a good topic to have, a, have an overview on and to look at the options and then also what we can do as, uh, as surgeons um, to, to prevent strictures from happening and to at least reduce our risk of, of these things occurring. Um, as expected, I have no disclosures. Uh, and so again, the objective for today uh, would be to discuss the causes and pathophysiology of upper tract stricture formation. Uh, we'll review endoscopic and surgical methods for stricture management and their benefits and drawbacks. Um, as well as we'll talk a bit about um, other technologies and, and things that we can do as surgeons uh, to uh, prevent um, strictures from happening as well as to aid in uh, ureteral reconstructive surgery. And so we'll start off with a brief overview of, of ureteric stricture disease, uh, this pathophysiology and some of the relevant anatomy. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, so the ureters basically uh, are responsible for bringing urine from the from the kidneys down to the bladder. Um, for for the purposes of stricture discussions, um, it's just nice to be able to differentiate between uh, proximal, uh, mid, and distal ureter, or upper, middle, and lower ureter. Uh, the upper ureter basically consists of the ureter going from the uh, UTJ down to the pelvic brim. Uh, the middle ureter would be from the pelvic brim. Uh, down to the, uh, the level of the sacrum, or down to, the, yeah, down to the level of the mid sacrum, and then from, uh, level of the mid sacrum down to the UVJ would be the lower, uh, lower ureter, the distal ureter. Uh, the caliber of the ureter is usually anywhere from 1.8 to 3 millimeters, depending on where you are in the ureter, uh, with natural narrowings over the UPJ, uh, crossing over the iliac as well as at the UVJ. Uh, common areas for stones, for example, to get uh, to get stuck at. And then three kind of key functions of the ureter are to maintain peristalsis, uh, have compliance as well as be uh, not absorbing uh, to to the urine within it. Uh, talking briefly about the vascular supply as well, uh, and that'll be relevant for for some of the etiologies of stricture formation. Uh, the arterial supply of the ureter, um, their branches off of the renal artery, approximately, uh, primarily, uh, as well as uh, up to 10% of the proximal ureter is being fed by the gonadal artery as well as the aorta. Uh, the mid aorta is fed, or sorry, the mid, ure mid ureter is uh, being fed by branches off of the gonadal um, aorta as well as the common iliac. And then distally, uh, the superior of the cycle uh, artery, as well as the in or, um, internal iliac artery branches, uh, supply some of the ureter as well. Uh, the inferior of the cycle artery uh, supplies the distal ureter in males, uh, whereas the uterine and vaginal arteries are responsible uh, in female patients and female people. Um, the ureter itself uh, carries a quite a rich adventitial arterial network along its length, uh, which provides plenty of collateral supply in the case of any sort of arterial disruption. Um, smaller vessels and capillaries then penetrate from there into the lamina, uh, into as deep as the lamina appropriate to perfuse uh, the, the inner tissue. And then uh, looking kind of at the at the area of the distribution or the, the distribution of the arterial supply uh, in the abdominal ureter uh, we're usually looking at a medial supply uh, from from the various structures we talked about uh, whereas in the pelvis uh, it's more so a, a lateralized supply and that's kind of why I have this dotted line there to, to delineate that um, and, and that kind of has implications for you know ureteral lysis uh, and any work that you do in the, in the, in the abdomen to free up the ureter uh, to get access in order to not devascularize it. Uh, brief look at the histology here. Uh, so looking at the proximal and distal ureters, there are some differences uh, depending on where you are along the ureter uh, with, um, with uh, kind of more of a thicker structure in the distal ureter, up to three muscular layers, um, consisting of both longitudinal and circumferential fibers, 
as well as a thicker urethelium in the distal ureter compared to the proximal ureter. And now these two kind of histologic changes or two different histologic differences uh, have implications on the relative functions of both of these um, both of these parts of the ureter, uh, with the proximal ureter being a bit more compliant and allows for more tortuosity in the context of obstruction uh, to keep intrarenal pressures low, uh, but is also more prone to injury, more prone to, uh, to perforation in, in the cases of, uh, of obstruction acutely. Uh, whereas the distal ureter, it's a bit more resilient and forgiving, um, and uh, it's also associated with smaller stricter formation as well as being a bit more resilient to stricter formation uh, with with distal stones and distal stone impaction, for example. Uh, the ureter characteristic in the sense that it has a, quite a thick lamina propria. Um, the stellate appearance of, of the ureter allows for up to 17 times um, 17 times dilation of, of its uh, of its um, dry caliber. Um, and then we already talked about the adventitial vascular plexus, uh, which you can see kind of on the edges of, of these histologic images. You can see some blood vessels that are supplying uh, the edges of the, the edges of the ureter here. Um, and so uh, dating back in 1993, there was, um, there was uh, histologic and anatomical work on the ureter uh, in um, in vitro, which demonstrated that muscle layer disruption uh, is, all, is ultimately um, a major cause of stricture disease, uh, which has implications, obviously, on, on, on iatrogenic causes as well as stone impacting causes of ureter formation. Um, so, broadly, the, the principles of the pathophysiology of stricture formation uh, involves an initial uh, insult, collagen depth, depth position, as well as remodeling or or um, or alter remodeling uh, of a natural healing process, and so fibrosis in general is caused by um, is, is is a normal um, normal process in, in wound healing, um, and it, 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 its derangement is actually what um, what leads to stricture formation and scarring. Uh, abnormal scarring, that is. So with an initial insult, uh, you get uh, platelet activation uh, as well as clotting immediately for hemostasis. Uh, this then leads to a signaling cascade and recruitment of innate immunity cells such as neutrophils and macrophages to the area. Um, at that time, uh, the macrophages and the neutrophils themselves release cytokines uh, to recruit uh, fibroblasts and lymphocytes to the area of the injury. Um, the fibroblasts uh, also are then responsible for secreting extracellular matrix protein uh, deposition, such as collagen. Um, and then ultimately, with further remodeling, you end up with wound contraction and re-epithelialization re uh, of the wound. Um, and, and it's actually right around this time where where you can get uh, derangements in this and, um, and end up with or, or dense scarring. Um, so with scar formation, you end up with excessive deposition of these extracellular matrix proteins, um, including collagen, fibronectin, proteoglycans, uh, integrins. Um, and this is in response to both uh, an initial injury as well as in chronic inflammation. So when you have chronic inflammation, uh, you have long-term deposition of these, of these complexes uh, uh, and of these proteins. Um, cells themselves also contain um, contain various signatures that when cells lice or when cells die, uh, they are released and they are picked up by the immune cells. Um, these are called damps or damps associated molecular patterns, uh, and they're uh, intracellular molecules that uh, that are released, such as DNA fragments and certain proteins. Um, in response to hypoxia, um, you know, this is something that you can see uh, when cells apoptose. Uh, these damps are recognized by pattern recognition receptors on uh, innate immunity cells and uh, they themselves activate downstream immune cascades and pro-fibrotic pathways. Um, one of these such pathways we can talk about is uh, transforming growth factor beta. Um, or TGF beta. It's, it's a protein that 
being looked at currently as possible therapeutic options. Um, we see that uh, here initially, um, cytokines are produced by macrophages and fibroblasts. Um, and so one of these cytokines is TGF beta. It causes the recruitment of other macrophages and fibroblasts, and the cells propagate pro-inflammatory signaling cascades uh, and protein synthesis. Uh, TGF beta bound, binds to TGF beta receptors one and two, uh, which then phosphorylate MAD proteins, uh, which then act, which then act as uh, transcription factors as well as um, regulators of uh, regulators for MR uh, microRNA um, expression, um, and these end up leading to the production of these proteins uh, as well as suppression of um, uh, suppression of antifibrotic uh, transcriptions uh, in, in the form of these microRNA signaling. Um, so looking at this pathway again, there's been multiple areas that have been proposed for intervention um, for not just ureteral scarring, but also um, fibrotic diseases in general. Uh, this particular example was taken from uh, from a review article that's looking at renal uh, fibrosis and a form of uh, renal, renal fibrosis and a form of a chronic kidney disease. Um, and so these various areas uh, and inhibitions of the, of the pathway have been proposed as areas for potential manipulation. Um, however, complete blockade of TGF beta 1 is likely not going to be um, feasible in the sense that it's heavily involved in other immune functions, and so um, it, it would have uh, quite severe downstream implications of this. Um, so then looking at um, urethral stricture etiology in the form of kind of more clinical data, um, there, there's various ways and various ways to categorize um, the etiologies of these strictures. Um, I think the, there's kind of um, a good framework to, to look into this is on the one second. I think we're getting some annotation from um, here. Let's see. Can I clear that? There we go. Um, sorry about that. Yeah. So a good, good way to framework this is um, is into benign uh, etiologies or uh, acquired etiologies and uh, congenital etiologies. Um, and so a lot of this discussion today will be based on acquired urethral stricture management, um, whereas congenital uh, abnormalities are often dealt with in, in, the, in the pediatric setting when, uh, in, in the, almost in the neonatal setting when, uh, when patients present with, um, with signs of obstruction on birth. Um, up to 35% of strictures are caused uh, by benign and iatrogenic causes of uh, There are some, there's about 20% of strictures caused by idiopathic means and infection. And uh, finally, a, a 10% of strictures can be, of acquired urethral strictures can be attributed to malignant causes. So uh, in keeping, keeping that in mind, um, the majority of these uh, benign urethral strictures um, are caused by impacted stones. Uh, there was a there was a classic study by Roberts et al. in 1998, uh, which demonstrated uh, stone impaction for greater than or equal to two months was associated with a 24% chance of developing a urethral stricture at the site of the stone impaction. Uh, so thinking back to our slides on histology, uh, it is likely due to localized ischemia uh, resulting from the constant pressure of the stone against the walls of the ureter. Um, ultimately leading to a compression of the microvasculature followed by uh, ischemic stress on the cells as well as cell death. Um, it's also thought that there's some microtrauma caused by the stone as well, uh, which leads to a, a direct local inflammatory reaction uh, to the foreign body. And then so uh, finally signaling of the pro-fibrotic and inflammatory uh, pathways that eventually lead to a risk, uh, increased risk of stricture formation. Uh, so looking at the axial slice of the CT here, um, the arrows are pointing towards this periaortic uh, fibrosis. 
which is a hallmark finding of uh, retroperitoneal fibrosis. Uh, so retroperitoneal fibrosis itself refers to a set of diseases and disease processes which result in abnormal chronic fibrosis uh, in the retroperitoneum. There are several forms of this disease, uh, including malignant, benign, and idiopathic causes. Uh, the idiopathic cause, uh, an idiopathic form is also known as Orman disease, uh, and it's thought to be um, basically a variant or a progression of IgG4 disease, often treated with uh, corticosteroids in response to inflammation. Uh, as you can see, retroperitoneal fibrosis also has implications on urologic practice uh, in the form of extrinsic compression of the ureters, leading to obstruction, renal failure, uh, flank pain. Um, and also in the context of today's discussion, uh, up to approximately 15% of the nine ureteral structures can be attributed to retroperitoneal fibrosis. Uh, and then uh, finally here as well, uh, endometriosis is also attributed to about 1% of the ureteral structures. Um, endometriosis is a condition characterized by endometrial tissue that's found outside of the uterine cavity, uh, usually resulting in chronic abdominal and pelvic pain, intra-abdominal adhesions, pelvic inflammation. Uh, this usually results in distortion and compression of the ureters at the distal aspect, as well as local chronic inflammation uh, around the ureters, uh, contributing to uh, ureteral structure formation. Um, iatrogenic causes make up about 35% of all acquired ureteral structure disease. Um, as you can see, it's kind of the about half, anywhere from half to three quarters of iatrogenic ureteral injuries uh, can be uh, are, are, are they take place during uh, gynecology surgery. Uh, most commonly, these occur um, during uh, abdominal hysterectomies, um, during which the uh, the vascular pedicle for the um, uh, for the uterus. Um, the control of that is kind of where the injuries occur as the ureter crosses over the uterine arteries. Um, and so various reports state about 0.2 to 0.4 percent of all hysterectomies um, being complicated by some degree of ureteral injury. Um, another area that this is commonly um, commonly seen in is a general surgery or specifically colorectal surgery. Um, where about anywhere from 4 to 17 percent of iatrogenic strictures uh, or iatrogenic um, ureteric injuries occur. Um, most of these happen in distal colectomies, and so um, depending on on where uh, where we look, you know, anywhere from 0 0.3 to 10 percent of all distal colectomies are complicated by some degree of distal ureteric injury. Um, historically, at, in the early days of MIS. Uh, there was um, there was discussion about greater injury risk with MIS surgeries, uh, given that you lose the tactile uh, feel. But more recent studies have shown that MIS, um, with you know surgical skills improving as well as the advancement of technology, uh, likely is attributable uh, for the um, reduced risk actually of MIS compared to open. Um, and even less risk now with uh, robotic surgeries uh, in play uh, due to some, some of the technologies that we'll talk about later um, with, you know, odd ratios down to even 0.5% um, with uh, robotic surgery. Uh, and, and finally, uh, urology, um, we, we are also responsible sometimes for uh, iatrogenic injuries to the ureter and causing strictures. Um, Again, depending on the source, anywhere from 8 to 44 percent of acquired ureteral strictures um, from an iatrogenic cause are due to urology or urologic intervention. Um, ureteroscopy itself carries a 1 to 3 percent um, stricture risk, including and often uh, due to ureteral access seats and vascular related injuries. Um, ureteral access seats in, in one of these studies by Traxler and Thomas in 2013 uh, demonstrate up to 46.5% of uh, ureteral access teeth usages uh, develop some degree of ureteral injury, anywhere from a mucosal injury uh, to um, uh, to a ureteric avulsion even at times. Um, probably the most uh, most interesting for us today would be um, looking at impacted stones and, and how they affect the ureter. 
um, as well as how, how it's implicated in management of these stones. Uh, there was a study by Stam et al., uh, which showed a 7.8% stricture rate in impacted stone, stone cases following ureteroscopy, uh, which is more than, at least more than double of the baseline ureteroscopy stricture risk, uh, that we see above. Um, open surgical, uh, strictures, um, happen, or sur surgical strictures happen at, in open surgeries as well, um, virtually at all sites of anastomosis. Uh, whether that's your, your ureteral enteric for oncologic surgeries, uh, or for reconstructive surgeries, um, as well as like, uh, transplant ureteral vesicle anastomoses, uh, or ureteral vesicle anastomoses in the context of previous recon, uh, or management of iatrogenic injuries. Uh, suspectomies in, in a study by Kim, Kim et al. in 2010, um, Looked at a uh, looked at a large American population. Uh, I don't have the numbers noted down, unfortunately. Uh, but um, an anastomotic stricture rate uh, anywhere from 2.7 to 8.8 percent of cystectomies are complicated by uh, anastomotic strictures. Um, and uh, Mano et al. in 2012 described uh, a 2.6 uh, percent ureteral vesicle anastomotic stricture rate uh, in renal transplantation in a series of a thousand a thousand and four patients. Uh, during uh, renal transplantation. And so, uh, looking at a broad, uh, large population based assessment, um, this study was performed, um, it was published in 2020, looking at, um, American cases of ureteroscopy for, uh, kidney stone disease. Um, the, the study took place in retrospective looking at 2008 to 2019. Uh, in which uh, 329, almost 330,000 cases um, had been collected for the purposes of the study. They looked at uh, comparing uh, extracorporeal shockwave lift atrophy versus ureteroscopy, um, and they used uh, shockwave lift atrophy as a control, basically as a way to isolate stone-related factors um, for uh, for structure formation. Um, without, without, uh, direct instrumentation of, of the ureter. And they found that, uh, with a baseline stone related risk of 1.5%, which is what they found in the, in shockwave lift atrophy, um, there was a 2.9% chance of developing a stricture following ureteroscopy, uh, for all comers there. Uh, in our analysis, they also identified, uh, several, uh, risk factors during their multivariate analysis. Uh, including preoperative hydronephrosis, uh, prior intervention for stones, as well as concurrent stones, all contributing um, to an increased uh, risk of developing a ureteral stricture. Uh, looking at this data, actually, it's kind of interesting to see that ureteral stones uh, actually had a had an adjusted odds ratio of 0 0.78, um, less than uh, what we would expect. Um, and uh, this this can actually be explained by uh, the majority of ureteral stricture or ureteral stones being relatively uncomplicated, non-impacted, and distal, uh, therefore requiring a requiring uh, less instrumentation, um, less inflammation, and uh, and impaction, um, less of that microvascular um, derangement, uh, and then finally also the distal stones being. Uh, um, in an area that's more robust and um, less prone to stricture development than than the proximal ureter. Um, furthermore, there's also radiation therapy. Uh, the, the data isn't quite clear on on uh, the percentage that it contributes to uh, iatrogenic ureteral strictures, uh, mostly due to the long-standing kind of uh, or the a long uh, lead up time for clinical presentation of stricter disease following radiation. Uh, radiation itself induces DNA damage leading to cell death, uh, including in healthy tissue. Uh, microvascular injury, late fibrotic reaction, and impaired tissue healing and perfusion are, are hallmarks for um, radiation therapy. Um, and so, like I said, many years after radiation is kind of when we start to see stricter disease forming. Uh, Quite common in cervical, endometrial, and colorectal cancers, 
uh, cervical cancer being implicated with a 0.15 annual risk of radiation strictures up to about 2.5% at 20 years. Um, there's also risks associated with uh, infection, um, tuberculosis, tuberculosis and schistosomiasis. Uh, both are, are known contributors to um, acquired urethral strictures with schistosomiasis um, uh, causing up to um, or uh, GU schistosomiasis uh, having about a 92% chance risk of developing a stricture uh, in this series by al Sukri et al. Um, malignancy can also cause extrinsic compression um, leading to uh, urethral stricture development um, due to microvascular um, injury as well as uh, the extrinsic compression itself causing obstruction. Uh, congenital urethral strictures can also occur. Um, they're the most common type of intrinsic uh, urethral strictures, um, and most commonly we'll see them in uh, UPJ, congenital UPJO, um, primary obstructive mega ureter, uh, UVJ neural stenosis and stricture, um, as well as obstructive urethral field. And so we've already kind of talked about a lot of these risk factors and, and various ways to get strictures. Um, there was a, uh, there was a study done at our center actually, um, looking at the risk factors and treatment options, uh, for patients with a urethral stricture disease. Um, here we see that, uh, this is a retrospective chart review, um, between 2006 and 2013. Uh, it was a series of 25 patients and the majority of these, uh, strictures were, were stone related. Um, and approximately 28% uh, were, were radiation related. Um, and so we can see that uh, for the majority of these strictures developing, uh, the reason that for the difference in the end numbers is some people had bilateral stricter disease. Um, the, the majority of strictures were distal um, and, and usually um, anywhere from, uh, like they, they kind of had any degree of, of stricture length uh, using, using one centimeter of the cutoff between short and long. Uh, ultimately, um, the kind of more severe, um, uh, the kind of more severe, um, interventions for these strictures, uh, were seen in radiation induced strictures where urinary diversion was required in order for, uh, um, uh, in order for, um, urine bypass or urine, um, uh, anti grade flow and no longer depending on nephrostomy or drain. Okay. Um, so uh, overall, stricter disease is quite costly, not just to the medical system, uh, but as well um, has impact the quality of life, morbidity, and life expectancy for these patients. Um, iatrogenic injuries are associated with high litigation costs, obviously more so in, in the United States compared to Canada. Um, and uh, they usually require more complex fixes, often with variable success rates, multiple interventions. Um, and, and patients can, can often expect uh, hydronephrosis um, with uh, potential long-standing renal failure if, if not addressed um, early enough. Um, and not just, and not addressed definitively. Uh, they could be subject to chronic stenting as well as multiple operations, multiple laparotomy kind of uh, operations or 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 MIS procedures. Uh, so investigations, there's there's quite a quite a lot uh, in the armamentarium um, in order for us to investigate uh, stricter disease. Um, ultrasound is a good initial investigation in order to detect um, uh, detect hydronephrosis. Uh, very rarely can you characterize a stricture adequately with, with ultrasound, uh, in which case the CT adrenaline and pelvis with contrast and delayed imaging or a CT IVP, uh, is often required, um, at which point, uh, there are several things you'd be looking for depending on the suspected etiology, whether that's, uh, contrast extravasation in the context of a transection, um, uh, versus, um, like intraluminal versus extraluminal obstruction would also be better delineated on, on cross-sectional imaging such as a CT. Um, so this would usually take care of at least the uh, anti-grade or the proximal aspect of the stricture. Um, looking at the distal aspect of the stricture, 
Uh, you can use a re- retrograde uh, pilogram, um, or you can do an up, up and down approach with both a retrograde and an integrated pilogram in order to, to better characterize a stricture, especially in, in strictures where there's uh, complete obliteration of the, of the lumen. Um, go, undergoing a diagnostic ureteroscopy plus or minus biopsy would be helpful in the case of a potential malignant stricture. Um, and then also looking at to obtaining a nuclear medicine renogram uh, in order to uh, look at split function can also help to uh, to guide your uh, management options. Um, and so in, in situations for intervention include malignancy, obstruction, you know, failure, recurrent infections, and pain. And so quickly we'll go through uh, what we can do to prevent ureteral injuries. Um, and so uh, up to 70% of ureteral injuries are diagnosed postoperatively, and there's, you know, anywhere from the surgery, from ligation, incision, thermal injury, devascularization, um, as well as the direct side effect of the therapy can all be caused by astrogenic stricters. Um, we kind of talked about urologic surgeries that could be uh, involved in stricture formation. And so, uh, it's key to know that early diagnosis and management improves outcomes, so we should be maintaining a high index of suspicion, uh, and we should be using um, some adjuncts, or we should consider using some adjuncts uh, to aid in ureter identification interoperatively uh, for non urologic procedures. Uh, and this doesn't just go for urologic uh, surgeries, but also um, other abdominal surgeries. Um, and so looking, looking at um, kind of more recent data, uh, going from 2006 to uh, October 2015, um, there was a study by Mayo et al., which looked at ureteral injuries uh, in colorectal surgery um, and the impact of laparoscopic and robotic-assisted approaches. Uh, they, they used um, ICD-9 and ICD-10 data from uh, the National Inpatient Sample Database. Um, and here we can see that, uh, especially kind of in more recent times, um, there's been a shift again towards uh, laparoscopic MIS robotic cases actually uh, being uh, associated with less risk of lower ureteric stricture risk uh, compared to open. Um, some endurologic specific considerations that we would be um, uh, that we would need to keep in mind um, is that when uh, when performing stone surgery, for example. We want to minimize our operative time, minimize our time in the ureter, um, and if needed, especially for more difficult cases, more complicated cases, or large stone burden, uh, we can always come back for a relook if necessary. Um, we uh, should be looking at early management of impacted stone disease. Again, thinking back to that two month, uh, two month kind of uh, cutoff for uh, up to 24% stricture risk formation. Um, Sparingly using ureteral access sheets and uh, kind of uh, making all of our moves as efficient as possible, uh, using resources sparingly can go a long way also in um, in reducing our risk that, um, in, in the ureter. Uh, Pre-stepping the ureter prior to operation is, is another way to um, open up the ureteral caliber, um, allowing for greater efflux of, um, of uh, warm irrigant, for example. Um, as well as um, helping with the effects, uh, or like making making uh, lasering easier by by pulling us away from the from the ureteric wall, if at all um, concerned. Uh, there was also this one paper that I found on laser specific risk, um, looking at comparing holmium versus sodium fiber lasers. Uh, it was albeit it was a it was a smaller population uh, with smaller numbers, but um, uh, they found that there was actually um, uh, there was quite an increased risk of ureteric stricture formation following uh, sodium fiber ureteroscopy, uh, which they attributed possibly to the heat formation um, as a result of sodium fiber lasering. Uh, we know that sodium fiber lasers have a better stone free rate, better at stone dusting and tissue ablation uh, with faster operative time, um, but um, uh, heat generation is a drawback and to be balanced with operative technique and irrigant uh, efflux. Um, so uh, it's something to, something to consider as well as looking at um, uh, looking at 
operative technique uh, as a way uh, itself to uh, to improve outcomes. Uh, so preoperative spending for non-endourologic cases. Uh, this is this is a photo actually of my, the first time I scrubbed in, and this is Drew Phillips, one of our uh, recent graduates from the program. Uh, here we are doing uh, preoperative spending um, for uh, for a gynecology case. Um, it also provides a tactile market for pelvic surgeries, uh, both for MIS as well as open procedures. Uh, itself, it's minimally invasive, uh, provides a visual markers as well as rigidity. Um, but uh, probably uh, most importantly, it, it provides a safety net if there's further management required in, in the case of an injury or further diagnostics required um, if there is a need for a post-office stent. Uh, some, most of the data now actually suggests that um, there's no difference to iatrogenic injury rate, and a lot of this is actually just down to surgeon preference at the time of the operation. Uh, so it's, it's not something that is routinely recommended because it, it, it itself carries some risk. Um, and so uh, in, in this um, population-based study as well, uh, 27, 28,000 patients, uh, 458 of them had sent place. Um, there was no statistical difference in, in the rate of iatrogenic injury, uh, with 45 uh, patients of the 27,000 having an injury, whereas none um, with, with a stent in place. Um, so, so something to consider here um, for uh, not needing uh, routine, not needing preoperative stent routinely. Light extent is another way that we can uh, we can use uh, in order to help identify the ureters. Um, and so it's useful because it provides a landmark um, both for the dissection as well as the handling of the ureter. Uh, there's white light or there's infrared options available um, commercially uh, for this. Although I, although I personally don't have um, much uh, much experience with uh, with these light extents myself. Uh, near infrared intraoperative imaging uh, is something that's uh, that's something that's in the market now and it's incorporated into um, into various uh, platforms such as the Da Vinci, uh, the da Vinci robot. Um, and this sign in green is a commonly used uh, fluorophore. Um, it has a pretty favorable safety profile with um, an adverse event rate of 0.34%. Um, and it can be used both intraluminally as well as um, as well as intravenously as ways to help both detect ureters as well as to uh, investigate uh, ureteral perfusion at the time of anastomosis or at the time of ureteral repair. Um, and so Stryker Spy uh, Imaging is, is the is a Stryker platform uh, for this um, and it, it combines uh, IV uh, indesign and green with uh, near infrared imaging. Um, there's robotic laparoscopic and handheld um, modalities uh, that are that are available. And so um, basically what it does is it, there's a filter that's, um, that's applied in the time of oper operating with the robot um, or laparoscopically. And then um, it's overlaid digitally onto, um, onto like a, a grayscale image of the, of the operative field uh, as a way for real-time ureteric um, identification during the, during the operation. Uh, there was a study by White et al. Um, it was, a, again, a small kind of cohort looking at intraureteral uh, indesign and green. Uh, and it's used in, um, uh, it's used in ureteral identification um, and avoidance during uh, robotic-assisted colorectal surgeries. Um, in this case, in this uh, cohort of, of 16 patients, there was no intraureteral, or no ureteral injuries or uh, adverse events uh, that were detected. Um, and this was this is done with uh, intraluminal um, ICD injection here. Um, here, uh, there's uh, this is actually a demonstration of the IV used for um, for IV uh, for indesign and green. Uh, this is at the time of radical cystectomy as a way to prevent uh, ureteral enteric and asthmatic strictures. Uh, looking for well perfused areas of the ureter um, for for its um, for um, better perfusion at the time of the of the healing. Uh, the retrospective review uh, looking at the results of a single surgeon, uh, 61 patients, 
Um, and um, five of the, or 16% of non indocyan and green um, patients developed an aspirin wash picture compared to uh, 3.2% uh, of patients that did use indocyan and green. So uh, potentially a, a helpful adjunct um, to the surgeries here. Uh, and finally, uh, management of ureteral strictures. Um, so there's endourologic techniques, uh, stenting, uh, for the urinary diversion uh, in the form of nephrostomy tube. Um, there are, uh, there are options with balloon dilation as well as endourethrotomy. Uh, ureteral stents, there's various stent technologies that are available at our disposal, uh, polymer stents, metal stents, um, there's tandem stents that we can use, uh, as well as uh, a bit of a discussion on drug eluding stents. Um, so ureteral stent placement is good. It's a good option for uh, initial management, um, the initial management of short uh, intrinsic intraluminal uh, stricture disease. Um, chronic stent placement and exchanges can be used in people who are poor surgical candidates, terminal patients, um, people who are too frail to be brought to the um, to the operating room for a larger procedure, a larger reconstructive procedure, for example. Um, and you can consider tandem stenting as a single stent drainage fail. Um, it's less reliable in treating external ureteral compression, however, um, and its chronicity, or, or chronicity, or chronic case, I mean, uh, requires multiple regular stent exchange procedures. Um, so they, they usually have good uh, initial success uh, with anywhere from 75 to 88% uh, reported success, uh, but long-term outcomes and disease progression especially malignant obstruction um, is um, is associated with, with stenting. Uh, Sally et al. De uh, described a case uh, or a series of patients uh, with approximately 81% um, initial success rate, uh, but up to 37% of the original cohort required nephrostomy to by nine months um, in, in the setting of gynecologic malignant obstruction. Uh, this can, so single stenting, single double J stenting can be, um, can be, um, bolstered by uh, doing tandem stenting, uh, with, um, 73 to 85 percent success in malignant obstruction long term. Um, the nine strictures, uh, there's 89, or sorry, 29 percent failure rate, but this is looking up to about, uh, two years out, uh, in, in this cohort by Vera Gorn et al. Um, another type of stent uh, is this Uventa mesh stent. Um, it, it was a, it's a, a thermoelastic um, mesh stent that was uh, initially brought into the market. It was uh, unfortunately um, uh, it was unfortunately associated with poor outcomes with major complications, including perforation, uh, bleeding, and, and, and fistula. Um, and it, it's since not something that's recommended uh, for routine use, at least. Uh, given these, given these complications and this complication rate. Uh, drug eluding stents is, is an area of, um, ongoing research. Um, and so various, uh, drugs have been proposed, all kind of targeting, uh, hyperproliferative, uh, inflammatory, profibrotic pathways and, and, uh, manipulating those. Um, and so far they've been, they've been described in, in animal models as well as in vitro. Um, and so, right, there's some promising success at this point, but nothing yet has been uh, routinely used in the human population. Uh, by balloon dilation is also another way to manage uh, strictures. Uh, it's usually reserved for shorter strictures, less than two centimeters, uh, and they can be performed both uh, retrograde and anti-grade. Uh, there is variable success rate, um, anywhere from 40 to 74%. Uh, depending on um, depending on the etiology of the stricture, uh, with the nine strictures having slightly better success, um, approaching about sixty to seventy percent. Um, there's good outcomes when the stricture is anastomotic in nature. Um, usually, when there's a good um, good perfusion, um, non irradiated tissue, um, post ureteral post uh, ureteral ureterostomy is pyeloplast and as well as pyeloplasty. Uh, are good candidates for balloon dilation, uh, but it often requires multiple repeat dilations, um, and and you cannot use them in in, in uh, active infection. Uh, endourethrotomy is is a technique that can be used uh, for um, 
for stricter management. Um, usually it requires a full thickness longitudinal incision along the stricture. Um, cold knife electric cautery and laser can all be used. Um, and the key to this is cutting away from possible adjacent vessels. So this is going back to the anatomy of the ureter and, and when to, when to, um, uh, when to be cognizant, uh, of the blood supply there. Um, you want to do this in a, a non-ischemic cause of the stricture, shorter strictures, and, uh, strictures at the extremes of the ureter all have, uh, the best, uh, chance, best chance of success. Uh, but poor is the lateral split renal function predicts poor response. Uh, found in a study by Wolf et al. in 1997, uh, demonstrating the need for a, uh, arenogram prior to this operation. Uh, and so endourotomy associated with anywhere from 55 to even up to 98%, um, uh, fissure resolution rate. Uh, going on to surgical techniques, I'm going to try to, uh, get through this as quick as possible given the time constraint. Um, but, Key to note would be the area of the stricture, so proximal, mid, or distal ureter. Um, you don't want to look at the comorbidity of the patient, as well as the length of the stricture, as well, in, in selecting your modality of choice. Um, as well as prior surgery, prior radiotherapy in the area, uh, would be, would be things to consider. Um, as well as the life expectancy of the patient, uh, whether you be looking for, uh, more, uh, more, um, invasive procedures at that point. Uh, so principles would be needing good vascular supply, good drainage, um, and always looking for like a uh, wide spatulated tension-free um, anastomosis uh, of the mucosa um, as, as we're used to. And so um, this is uh, this is just a table that um, that makes it kind of summarizes potential um, management techniques um, depending on the ureteral defect length. Um, ureter, ure, ureterostomy, uh, usually used for short strictures for, uh, just primary excision of the, of the defect. Um, and so, uh, we'd be looking at, uh, just removal of that segment, um, as well as, uh, having an intraluminal stent, uh, to help with, uh, help with healing there. Uh, sometimes, um, there could be an old mental overlay over the repair, uh, to reduce, uh, stitula risk and as well as to, um, improve healing. Uh, trans-UU, trans-ureter or ureterostomy is a rarely used technique, uh, very similar to the UU as described above. Um, associated with high success rate, uh, however, it carries the risk of a distal obstruction causing um, complete obstruction, uh, complete obstructive uh, aneuric renal failure. Uh, so this risk alone is, is something to make us think twice about using this as, a, as an option. Um, so a ureteral reimplant or a ureteral neocystotomy, um, both, uh, like this is, a, it's a good technique and it could be, um, used, um, in, in conjunction with a stoic hitch or a bolari flap to augment the length of the repair. Um, it requires good bladder capacity and compliance, so preoperative testing is required prior to these operations, uh, but typically has a, a very high success rate, as we'll describe here. Uh, and so, uh, Fassenholt and, uh, Hyden Rick in, uh, 2021, uh, did a retrospective review, uh, 90, uh, did a, did a systematic review, no, over 90% reported success rate, uh, in, in these studies. Uh, again, we're looking at small, um, small cohorts here, anywhere from 10 to 34, uh, patients each, um, but, uh, specifically for robotic and, uh, robotic surgeries, Involving bar and so is pitch for distal strictures, uh, quite a high success rate. Uh, renal desensis, um, involves mobilizing the kidney unit, um, keeping its vascular pedicle and gaining some ureter length. Um, given the risks associated with this and, and, um, and, uh, the uh, outcomes of other techniques, uh, not often used, to, uh, not often used here. Uh, auto transplantation is so, uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's for very large or multiple ureteral strictures, uh, vastly limiting your, uh, healthy ureter length. Uh, it combines a donor nephrectomy essentially with a, a transplant into the iliac fossa as we're familiar with. Um, again, typically not a first line option due to the risk of potential, 
uh, your vascular injury and the complexity of the surgery itself requiring uh, some uh, ex- uh, some additional training and a fellowship in, in the transplant. Uh, so ileal ureter substitution is, is another way uh, that can be used um, for urinary or for ureteral repair. Uh, it's for large defects in the ureter with no theoretical limit in its length. Uh, it requires an otherwise healthy urinary and GI tract. So uh, contraindications include CKD, uh, bladder outlet obstruction, um, IBD, short gut syndrome, uh, and poor tissues in the form of radiation, enteritis, and cystitis. Um, complications would be a metabolic arrangements due to reabsorption of the urine, um, uh, as well as having a, a reflushing system, increasing your risk for infection. Uh, buccal mucosa graft um, is, is an option for short stricture repairs uh, with good access to the ureter, so um, especially with uh, disease anterior segments. Um, and this is it's a consideration uh, to be used when when other surgical techniques and other surgical options aren't aren't as amenable. Um, and those, so this could be performed both as an onlay as well as an augmented urethroplasty. Uh, depending on whether you just have a narrow lumen versus a completely obliterated lumen. Um, and so the augmented ureteroplasty just being um, uh, being development of, of this posterior um, posterior anastomosis followed by uh, essentially an onlay technique um, of the buccal mucosa. Uh, and so these are the general steps. The ureteral lysis followed by the bone of uh, the buccal mucosa graft harvest um, incision of the disease segment, uh, stenting, and then graft experiment over the defect, followed by an, uh, a mental um, overlay for graft intubation and uh, inoculation. Uh, there was a study done by Lee et al., uh, multi-institutional study, um, looking at three U.S. institutions for, uh, with 54 patients um, between October 2013 and March 2019, um, demonstrating Pretty good outcomes actually for uh, buccal mucosa grafting, uh, up to uh, up approximately 87% uh, overall success rate, uh, with quite low complications, uh, anywhere from uh, up approximately 6%, 5 to 6%. Um, and looking kind of uh, at a uh, at a retrospective or, or at a um, systematic review by Bellotta at all, uh, buccal mucosa grafting. Um, has had pretty good outcomes as well, anywhere from 67 to 100% success rate, um, especially with uh, taking into account the 67% success rate was uh, including four patients. Most of the patients actually had uh, radiation therapy requiring um, reoperation. So uh, the radiation therapy alone can be a factor attributed uh, to poor success here. Uh, appendiceal interposition is a uh, technique that can be used for proximal or mid-ureteric strictures, usually for the right side, uh, but can be performed on the left in some pediatric populations. Uh, it can be performed both as an onlay as well as an interposition um, due to a risk of anastomotic stricture as a result of the interposition. Um, and so it, it's difficult to assess the feasibility preoperatively without seeing the the uh, appendix. Um, and so, uh, Obeda et al. Uh, described a one in five appendices insufficient for, for repair, um, and, uh, suggested that surgeons should plan for an alternative technique, uh, if, if there is, uh, insufficient appendix at the time of surgery. Hey, Ryan, it's, um, 7.58. Uh, we only have about two minutes left. Um, maybe you could just kind of wrap up and we can just take a couple of questions. That would be great. Totally, yeah. yeah. Um, last thing here would just be uh, tissue engineering. Um, it's, it's currently in the pipeline, basically, but not quite there yet in terms of uh, its ability for uh, human use uh, at this time. Um, and uh, so far, so far, it's, it's bench top and um, and in vivo in, in animal models. Okay. Sorry for the timing, everyone. Uh, but in summary, uh, ureteral stricture disease complex carries significant morbidity and impact to patient quality of life. Um, endoscopic and surgical management options are available and can be tailored to the location and size of stricture with reasonable success. Um, and there are targeted therapies and, and bioengineered tissue grafts that are um, that are coming in the pipeline, but not quite there yet. Uh, 
before being introduced to clinical practice. Um, so again, the, the objectives and, uh, thank you all for, for bearing with me. I know it ran over time. Um, and I'm sorry for that, but, uh, special thank you to Dr. Cavanaugh, Dr. Q and, um, and Victor Wong for looking at my slides prior to today. Good, Ryan. That's great. So, so questions for people, cause we do only have a couple of minutes. So wrap it up. Does anybody have any questions for Ryan?